Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies, and Trakel has a very generous offer for you Savvy Painter listeners. Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making for over 30 years, and now they're applying that same obsession to their professional grade art panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. So Trakel is offering you, the Savvy Painter listeners, an exclusive discount. From now through May 4th, when you use promo code SAVVY20, you get 20% off of your first order. I am delighted to introduce this week's guest, Alia Elabermani. Alia is a figure painter originally from Massachusetts, now living in North Carolina. In this episode, she talks about her current project, Special Snowflake, which is a self-portrait in which she continues her exploration with paper objects within her painting. At the same time, she has been painting a series of paper snowflakes in which she plays with the ideas of temporality and fragility. Alia studied with the Laguna College of Art and Design in California, and while studying there, she worked at a nearby gallery. While she was working there, she learned how to communicate with a gallery, what to look out for, and eventually she curated her first show. Since then, Alia has curated several exhibitions, most recently an exhibition of 80 artists called Sight Unseen with the Abend Gallery in Denver, Colorado. It was after a conversation about an exhibition titled Women in Art, which featured exactly zero female artists, Alia collaborated with Sadie Valeri and Diane Faisal to create their own show, Women Painting Women. Alia talks about this experience, how it impacted her, and their follow-up exhibition, Women Painting Women in Earnest. Clearly, Alia has a lot going on, so we spend a fair amount of time talking about balancing business and art. You can follow her current projects on her website, alia-fineart.com, and on Instagram at Alia Painter. So here is Alia Elbermani. Alia, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I am super excited to have you on the show this week. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. It's, it's a real honor. Can you tell me when you started painting kind of as more of a profession. I know like a lot of artists, we start drawing and and exploring art when you're young, but was there a moment when you, or a decision that you remember making when you were decided that you were going to pursue this as a career? Well, I actually, I wasn't one of those kids that drew all the time. I was really, really heavily into dance. I danced with Boston Ballet all through high school. And I thought my brother was going to be the artist. He was the one with the natural gift and just was always tinkering and welding and and making stuff. But when I went to the first college that I went to, I was a double, I decided to be a double major between art and dance. I couldn't, I, I had the impulse, but I just didn't think I was an artist yet. And those two demanding majors just were overwhelming. And I had to take some time off. And I think during that time taking, I took about a year off, worked at a coffee shop and just tried to figure my stuff out. And during that time is when I realized, you know, dancing is great, but it's, it's going to be a short lived career. And I do love making stuff and and being an artist. Mm. And at that point I knew I wanted to be a representational artist whatever that meant to me at that time, I, you know, it's hard to look, to look back and, and really know what I thought that was. But I started going to the library, actually, and looking through books of colleges. And what is now called Laguna College of Art and Design was the only one I could find that had sort of a classical figurative training and was accredited. Both of my parents are professors, or my mom is now retired, but professors at Tufts University Medical School. So it was a requirement that it was an accredited school that I would get some kind of piece of paper at the end. And even then, you know, there was strife between us. Being an artist, you know, just wasn't what they thought was gonna <laughs> <laughs> was gonna be for their daughter. You know, their 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 scientific analytical daughter, but. Right. (laughs) Where my heart was. And so I think really choosing to go to Laguna College of Art and Design was was the best choice I ever made and set me off in, in this path of representational painting and drawing. 
Wow. So how how did that feel to sort of go against, especially if you go to a school like Laguna College of Art and Design, there's there's no switch in majors to something more quote unquote practical. <laughs> like I think a lot of parents kind of go, well, if she's in a liberal arts college, for example, then she can always pivot somewhere else. But you're going there, you are committed. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Maybe graphic design sounds better at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I've always been contrarian. I don't, <laughs> my parents were used to it. <laughs> I am a pretty stubborn person and it's served me well, I guess. They said, okay, well, go try. And I, I did have to put myself through school. I worked at a toy shop the entire time and got a scholarship and made it affordable so that I could live in California, which at the time was not as crazy as it is now. <laughs> and and be able to afford to do that myself. I'm glad that they did that for me. To have to fight for it made it that much more valuable to me. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you talk a little bit about what you did after college? So after you graduated from LCAD, what what did you do like immediately following? And how are you? And I'm also, I'm always kind of curious, like, for other people, like when you, so you made this decision and you had some resistance from your parents. And there's, so there's definitely that starving artist fear, at least with your family, if not with yourself. But, what, you know, like when you're in college, you can just focus on painting and absorbing and learning everything you possibly can in those four years that you're there. And then it's kind of like you're a little bird on the edge of the cliff and you have to fly now. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, and, not having the access to the models in the community, oh. you know, the artist community, that was like, uh, that was a slap in the face, big time for me. But my last year of school, I was both working at a toy shop and working at a gallery. So I ended up going more full time into the gallery. And, and that was, you know, I could walk to it. It was right down the street. It was a good gallery with artists who are now my age showing there and being successful. And I learned so much working in that gallery about how to communicate with a gallery and how, what to look out for too. Um, and I also started making connections in other galleries. I curated my first show working for that gallery too. So it was, it was a really great move. I was making money, but I also set it up so that I was working four very long days a week and then painting the rest. So my 40 hours were, were 10 hour days, four days a week. And then the rest of the time I was in my studio. So still really trying to be a painter mm -hmm. the rest of the time and, you know, still fighting for it. There, there was that awkward maybe semester in between graduating. Well, not in between, just after graduating where, you know, I tried to sneak into classes and still get the free model and the teachers <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, they technically call it auditing, but it really still feels like you're sneaking in. Right. <laughs> you're an interloper and should really just be going out and trying to figure it out yourself. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> you just reminded me there was a guy when I was in, in college and I think he was – because you, I mean, you're allowed to, at least with you know where I went, you're allowed to come back and and continue to paint. And I think they even had like after you know like a a figure drawing workshop or figure painting workshops that was just open to any student, past or present. Oh, that's great. But there was this one guy that was in like would not only take advantage of that, and it was like a you know in the afternoon for like three hours, he would come to all of the the figure painting classes during the day too. And, <laughs> and, you know, at first you don't really know who he is. You're like, you know, in your first year, and this is the guy who's already graduated. You're like, Oh my God, that guy's so good. I can't believe how good he is. <laughs> and then the teacher would be like, I can't remember his name now, but it's like, it's been three years. You need to move on. Like, <laughs> I only did it for one semester. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> yeah, but they were more like, like, you need to go build your own studio and make your own art. You can't just, it's it's not that you can't, but it's not good for you to just come in and do the studio workshops for the rest of your life because right. you're good enough. <laughs> yeah. Get beyond the, the academic. Let's, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. 
<laughs> oh, that's really funny. So I'm curious, what were some of the things that you learned by working in the galleries? That's such a unique perspective that most artists don't get. The thing that always sticks out for me is to be conscious of how much discounts you give. The gallery will try to convince you to give as big a discount as they can possibly muster to try to to end the sale, to close the sale. Mm -hmm. So every contact that I have with a gallery now, I say, you know what, I am not accepting any more than whatever price, or, you know, whatever percentage discount. Mm -hmm. And there, and there were, there were a few artists in that gallery that said, no, absolutely zero discounts. And that was really eye opening for me. It was like the artist can dictate the terms. If they are wanted so much by the gallery, then they can dictate the terms and you don't have to, you know, it's a relationship. It doesn't have to be so one-sided. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because just knowing that you can do that, like, of course, people are going to ask for a discount. It's obvious. Like if you knew that when you went into the grocery store, and you bought all your groceries, and you just looked at the cashier and said, Can I have a 10% discount? <laughs> or whatever, can I have a 20% discount? Like that there's actually knowing that there's a number means, of course, I'm going to ask. Right. And I just recently bought something from, from a gallery and I didn't ask for a discount. I felt like it was kind of slimy. And I think my husband discussed that I didn't ask for a discount, but I feel like it's taking something away from both the gallery and the artist. And I could, I could afford not to, I didn't, I didn't want it. Right. I don't think most actors are, are going to care about that. But. <laughs> that is so interesting. So what were some of the other things that you learned about there, like about, you said that you curated your first show there. I did, yeah. Well, another thing too is not related to the curation, but just to not be a prima donna. <laughs> so many artists, you were so special, right? <laughs> I'm a special snowflake. I don't know about you, Alia. <laughs> that is actually a title for a painting that I'm working on right now. That's <laughs> so that's really funny that you just said that. <laughs> so you are a special snowflake. I special snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> but you walk, walk into, like you said before, a grocery store and you don't have an attitude. You don't deserve a whatever as an artist. I don't think you should have that attitude when you walk into a gallery either. You have to be, no matter who you're dealing with, if it's the, the gallerina behind the front desk as I was, or the director, you, you should have a nice attitude. <laughs> <laughs> respect for the person who conceivably you're about to ask to sell your work and, and, and enter into a relationship. Right. And pack your work and <laughs> ship your work. Oh yeah. Even more so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to be really nice to you. <laughs> yeah. You don't want your waiter spitting in your food. So you don't want your gallery to, to not treat you well because you've, you've been difficult. So, and there's, there's no reason to be difficult. We can all get along. <laughs> One would hope. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a good lesson. And then the, the opportunity to curate, I just, well, now I live in the South and I think especially for the South, I'm really self-motivated, but working in the gallery, I was, you know, you get to a certain point and you're just selling paintings and I wanted to do more than just sell paintings. You know, I had access to all these amazing artists and I wanted to create a theme and a show. And so I worked with my alma mater, Elcad, and the artist that the, the gallery that I worked for was Diane Nelson Fine Art in Laguna Beach. And it's it's no longer there. Um, she just recently retired, I think last last year. But using her artists and then also tapping some Northern California galleries that I had worked with through the gallery, put together a show called About Paint. And it was, it was literally different ways to use paint and, and make beautiful paintings. And so there were some artists that would scrape and scratch and sand, and then artists that would just really glop on these beautiful, all representational images, just because that's what I was really drawn to. So, and working with artists one-on-one -on -one like that was a great, great experience, learning how to, how to communicate and be organized. And I designed a catalog. So that experience was wonderful too. At that time too, we had a, a printer in Laguna Beach, you know, an offset set printer. So I learned a lot about working with offset printing. Mm. That was, I don't know that I would have access to that nowadays. You know, you just ship your digital files over to who, to, I don't know, China or wherever to get catalogs made. So yeah, working at that gallery was, was a great experience. 
And you also, I'm curious. So you also co-founded Women Painting on wi- Women, <laughs> Women Painting Women, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, not on. <laughs> yeah, no, not that. <laughs> not body painting. <laughs> It is women painting women. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And you've curated shows through that as well, correct? Yes. So myself, Diane Feisel and Sadie Valeri, as it turned out, we all met online through Facebook and through blogs. And it was actually on a blog post of Sadie's. She posted, there was a show put on by Sotheby's Auction House in New York and it was titled Women in Art. And it was all blue chip and it looked like a good show. But then when you clicked to look at the list of artists, there was not a single female artist included. This was 2009, I believe. It really set off a conversation mm-hmm. between, well, it was just a, a, on the in the comments section of Sadie's blog. And I posted there, I said, you know, we can take this back. We can, we can create an exhibition called women painting women. And then the conversation went offline or, you know, privately, not, not to the public. And we started going back and forth and I had always wanted to put together a artist retreat for women. And she, within that week had reserved the, the web domain, women painting women. And it just, we started posting images of painters, female painters who paint the figure, primarily female figure that are living. It was really important for us to, to show contemporary artists Yeah, and didn't put anything besides the title, the size, the media, and a link to their website, because ultimately it was about promoting these mostly unheard of artists And it just blew up. We had no idea how much interest that that blog would create. And within, so I want to say that we started it in March. And then by November, we were being contacted by Robert Lang Studios in in Charleston, South Carolina. They wanted to, to put on a Women Painting Women exhibition and asked us if we would be involved. They wanted us to jury the exhibition. And we decided that we didn't want to do that, that we had too many friends that we would have to say no to. And Mm. we didn't want to be put into that awkward position. So, so we asked that they do the curation. And I have to say that show was stunning. It had over 50 artists. I think it had a total of 54 artists from all over the world. It was primarily the United States, but then there were artists from the Netherlands and Italy and France and Holland, maybe, um, and maybe maybe some some other European countries that I'm not remembering right now. But walking into that show, it blew us all away. The power of mm-hmm. her and the, the curation that they did and the way they displayed everything. It's still the show that I think of in my mind when I'm uh, working on future women painting women things. That I've got to I've got to get back to that. <laughs> I've got to at least get to it, if not outdo it. I am working right now. There will be a touring museum exhibition this year that I've spent now three years of my life curating without any hope of pay or, you know, anything like that. Um, but it will it will premiere at um, Customs House Museum in Clarksville, Tennessee, and then move to Texas A&M's J. Wayne Stark galleries. This is all starting in August and then runs through December. Nice. Very cool. The title of that exhibition is Women Painting Women in Earnest. And I really, I I wanted, you know, we, we had such wonderful exhibitions with galleries. So Women Painting Women has had over a dozen exhibitions in galleries all over the United States, in Scotland, in Australia, I think in 2015. So all, all over the world, but with the galleries, there's always this commercial aspect that, yeah. that gets in the way of curation. Not all figurative art is sellable, but it, man, is it powerful. And, and I wanted to be able to show those works that are so, so powerful that have this deep, earnest meaning. And 
not have to worry about supporting the gallery. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where this, this idea for the women painting women in earnest sprang from. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, for sure. So I'm kind of curious, what is it that you, you know, in that first women painting women exhibition, what do you think contributed to making it so powerful? Well, I guess, you know, part of it is that it was um, blanking on the word, like new, you know, we, mm-hmm. up until that point, there had been very few exhibitions of women seeing themselves. How, how do we see and represent ourselves? Not from the male gaze perspective, where we're a, not an object, where we're sellable because we're sexy. Mm-hmm. The age range of the artists that were exhibited, as well as the women that were on the walls, was so broad and and so powerful because of it. It was it was hearing a whole conversation that hadn't been heard before, and like a conversation with a longtime friend or mentor, you know, like an older woman who who's gonna tell you how it is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she's not gonna pull any punches. Like she's got no more reason to to be the nice girl. Right. And if you can't take it, then you're going to be crying in front of this painting, you know, and it was, it was, and literally we would walk in, we spent a week. So I did end up organizing a retreat for a week for, there were 54 artists included, but we ended up finding a dozen that could come to this retreat and spent a week in Sullivan's Island, which is right near Charleston, rented a home, shared the expense. I organized all these painting trips out to, you know, Magnolia Cemetery and all these really cool places to bring a figure and paint. And we would pop into the gallery throughout that week. And inevitably, we would see somebody crying in front of one of our paintings. And that was an amazing experience. Wow. Yeah. Were you able to, like, I don't know if this is too, you know, would be too personal a question to ask that person, but were you able to ask them what it was that they were responding to? I, you know, I didn't think to do that. I just, I kind of soaked it in and knew what, what they were feeling. Cause I <laughs> do, I mean, it was like being seen for the first time, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I mean, the, when was it? It was uh, over a year ago, well over a year ago, but I was talking to Karen Kapke and, and she was talking about when she you know, the, the series of paintings she did of herself that were, you know, mostly of her torso. And we talked about the fact that like, you know, there's a certain age where you become invisible. Yes. Yep. Yep. I think I'm, I'm, I'm just about there. I, I, you know, during that retreat, there were, again, our, our age ranges from, were from like 20, I want to say she was 22, but she might've been a little bit older up to 72. All you know, a dozen women staying in a house together, and the conversations that we had. But one of one of them from several of the older women, older than me, women that were there, were okay, ladies, young ladies. You need to realize you got to hustle now while you're not invisible. And I would, you know, guffaw at that. And I, I this year for the first time, I'm starting to feel like I'm invisible. And it, and again, that goes back to I'm a special snowflake painting. <laughs> <laughs> is is all about all of this. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, you know, it's so weird because I remember so I always looked a lot younger than I was and I hated it. So I can't tell you how much I hated that. And I I mean, I got carded up until my I mean, like not just being like following the rule, but actually like really closely looking at it until I was like in my mid I would say like Maybe that stopped happening around 37. Wow. <laughs> and I remember being in college and I was taking this this course and like some computer cl- courses, computer design courses. And this one instructor just looked at me and she's like, you know, she's like, you're really, really good at what you do, but you're going to have a problem. You have to start wearing makeup. You have to <laughs> like, she's like, basically like, you look like you're 12 and you need to <laughs> <laughs> like nobody is going to take you seriously. And I, I like, I remember just being so irritated by that and just like, Ugh. and then, you know, like, and so now I'm starting to, it's really, I don't know, like, I don't know how to explain this. It's kind of, con- you know, I think as women, it's super confusing because part of us just accept that that's the way that life is. No, 
And then, <laughs> well, like on some level, like it just, I mean, I, I guess like <laughs> maybe the better way to put it, maybe not accept, but you're not surprised by it, right? Okay, there you go. That's yeah. a better word for it, <laughs> that I'm not surprised by it anymore. And I was just recently, like I was reading this thing where this, I don't know, this, it, it started, it was, it, it was accidental, but basically there's this, I don't, it doesn't matter what they do, but there was this firm and the main, one of the bosses was, would always criticize this female employee because it took her, he felt like it took her too long with the clients. Like she was, it, it would always take her twice as long as anybody else. Yeah. I and then her, on, on did Facebook. you just see that? Yeah. On Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That experiment, the social experiment of how the world treats you as a woman versus yeah. how, how the world treats you as a male, even, even just perception of a name. Yeah. Yeah. There've been so many studies about that and yeah. And it's so like, so that's the part like her, like I can, I totally sympathized with. So just to, um, if, if people haven't heard it, the short story is it started accidentally that they have a shared email account and her immediate supervisor sent an email to a client and got a response back that was really snarky and rude and not cooperative. And he was like, I've always had a great relationship with this client. What's going on? And then he realized that he sent it from this woman's email address. And so that started the social experiment where they switched accounts basically for a week or two weeks. So the guy was sending emails under the girl's name and the girl was sending emails from the guy's name. And she was just like, oh, my God, my job is so much easier because people don't second guess everything I say and they're cooperative. And he was his reaction was, oh, my God, you deal with this every day. Right. And I'm not as good as I thought I was. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Unfair playing field that that I assumed or, you know, presumed was my betterness. I'm like, no, sorry, honey. Right. (laughs) (laughs) All of that, like, it's none of it is surprising. And then when you get to and so I think like in a weird way, also as women, like I kind of had that same experience that. Um, you know, people would always tell me, oh, that's because you're young and cute or whatever. And I'd be like, I'm not cute. You know, like, and women also have this, you know, we're hypercritical of ourselves. And I'm like, I'm not cute. I don't know. Like somebody else is cute might be getting that treatment, but not me. And, (laughs) And then you start to feel that the start of the invisibility and you're just like, whoa. Yeah. The world that I walk in has, has just changed. Yeah. Uh, You know, I I don't know how I'll, handle it going forward because I'm just just now experiencing it but it doesn't change me at all no that's what I keep reminding myself you know and and even as a younger artist I never painted for anybody else so this isn't going to change what I do or how I paint or what I put out there so I I think I'm at peace with it and in a lot of ways like maybe it's freedom get your eyes off of me so I can do my work yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. That, that I kind of double think things all the time to confuse myself into <laughs> getting back to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess maybe that's an example. <laughs> Well, I think, I don't know, I do, I I think it's really helpful to, like, look for how this, instead of looking at the disadvantage for whatever situation, to try to figure out if it is what it is, then what, what's the good, good that can come out of it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, and it's also, yeah, you, you develop more and more empathy, and you also develop less and less willingness to settle to (laughs) censor yourself to take other people's crap you know it's more like I just find more and more I'm just like not my circus not my monkey I'm not playing your game if you want to play that I'm not playing (laughs) you know like whereas before I might try to like appease people I think I've always been like that I stomp my foot (laughs) (laughs) the more you push me to to be one way or the other uh uh-uh nope not gonna happen (laughs) (laughs) I think my parents are just both going to be nodding in agreement. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it's a weird thing. Like, if somebody tells me I can't do something, then game on. I'm doing it. Right. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. So have you ever bought something and thought, seriously, who makes this? They clearly don't know anything about the people who use their stuff. Well, that's one thing that you cannot say about Trakel. 
They are constantly talking with artists, going out to their studios, and watching how Turkel art supplies are actually used. Here's the founder of Turkel Art Supplies, Brian Turkel. Everybody has a sort of a different want and need, and the brush line continues to expand because everybody's found something somewhere that they really think is just it. And that's, that is sort of fascinating that they just haven't picked up this as a brush. You know, you use your bristles for, for your oils and your synthetics for your acrylics and your Blanskis for your watercolor, and they, they don't stick to that at all. They develop their own techniques, and that's the beauty of, of, of art in and of itself. You don't want to really be just repeating what's been done. We need to, we need to move forward. So it's something that keeps us on our toes, but you're always surprised what, what people come up with. And there's always a massive difference of opinion, too. So you can't really just start to base your whole theory of a brush on what one artist says, because you'll meet another artist that's got something totally different. And you then have to adjust everything you do to, to make sure that everybody's kind of happy with that. Well, it should be no surprise that a company that cares that much about their customers is going to give you, Savvy Painter listeners, a very special offer. Until May 4th, when you go to turkel.com and you buy brushes or panels or anything else that they have on their site, you can enter promo code SAVVY20 at checkout. That's S-A-V-V-Y-2-0. Just enter that into the promotional code before you check out and you get 20% off of your entire order. So cool of them to do that. And that's because they want to take care of you, the Savvy Painter listeners. So head over to turkel.com before May 4th to take advantage of that generous offer. I would love to hear about what you're working on now and a little bit about your studio practice. Can you, can you share that? Sure. Well, this year, starting in January, I I opened up my own teaching studio. So I'm still trying to figure out the balance between the business aspect of that. The teaching part I have down pat. I've been teaching at other venues for forever. But the managing emails and money and all that is so foreign to me. I'm not a very good business person. So that is taking up more time right now than I would, would like, Mm -hmm. but I am really enjoying having my own dedicated space to teaching. So right now this feels really, I feel like such a privileged brat for saying it, but I have two studios. (laughs) I have my, my teaching studio in Raleigh, and then I have a beautiful studio that my husband and I took two years to build over my garage at home. So I'm, I'm still figuring out the schedule between the two, but Mm -hmm. no matter what I'm, I'm painting five days a week, basically when my kids are in school. So from nine to three. That's so exciting for you though. Congratulations. And in a way, just like as a, as a comment, I think it makes total sense to have the two studios if you can, because you have the separation between the two worlds. I like that. Yeah, I I had for a while, for several months, tried to have students come to my home. You know, if I have to clean my bathroom for you, (laughs) I'm going to start resenting you. So that was just not not a good fit for me. It's so much better now. It's it's so lovely. I get to to go to teach, enjoy my students, enjoy my time there and leave everything there, there as it is. And then come home and my, my painting is still there. I didn't have to put it away or hide it because it's in some awkward state or, you know, so it is, it's a lovely separation right now. What is your normal, when you're working on your personal work, when you're above the garage, what are you working on? And, and what's sort of a normal day for you? Like, I guess what I'm looking for is, do you have any routines or things that you do like when to start off your painting time? Well, I'm a terrible insomniac, so I get a lot of my idea making done in the wee hours of the morning. I tend to like fall asleep early and then wake up at like one or three in the morning and then just can't get back to sleep. And so, oh, wow. so a big part of my practice is writing in those wee, wee hours in the morning. And I, I, it's just free form writing, whatever. Sometimes it's journaling. Sometimes it's like, okay, I saw this one little bug or whatever that was really inspiring and and just let it kind of flow from there. And eventually 
the words transition to images and I'll start doing thumbnails in the same book. But then, then the kids wake up and, <laughs> and that, <laughs> that one has to start. So th- th- once I get them off into their, their worlds, I'm able to go back up into my studio and start really painting. So sometimes that's, I prefer to paint from life. So sometimes I'll have a, a model or nature is a huge influence on me. Um, and a, a big reason why we're still in North Carolina is because we, we bought a home with a bunch of woods around us. Mm. So I can go in the woods and find all kinds of treasures to paint and bring them in, bring them inside and just enjoy the, the fleeting moments with, with nature as it literally decomposes in front of my eyes. Or if I'm working like this special snowflake, if I'm on that, that day, I have this whole installation of snowflakes that I, on Facebook, I asked any artist and and people have interpreted that word very broadly, (laughs) but any artist who wanted to send me a cut and folded paper snowflake (laughs) to send me their snowflake. And this, honestly, it started because I couldn't outsource it to my kids anymore. <laughs> they refused after, after two. So then I outsourced to other artists and it turned into this project of where I'm honoring all these incredible artists in our community. And so I've started inventorying every single one as they're mailed to me. I'm keeping the envelopes because I think I'm going to do something with the envelopes. The paper has been creeping into my work. Like collage type or? Well, no, sorry. Painting it? Yeah. So this I'm bouncing all over the place. I apologize. But my daughter got an origami kit for her birthday probably about two years ago and it sat in the closet and she didn't have any interest in it. And I saw it in the closet one day and took it out and started folding all these beautiful shapes and loved the act of doing it and loved how it was not what I was supposed to be doing. (laughs) Uh It was so different from painting. But then when, when it was done, there was this form and I couldn't imagine not painting that form. And, and so I painted it and, and then the next one and then the next one. And then I had a great Dane, beloved great Dane pass away. And I made a whole bouquet of white paper lilies and they slowly started to un, uncurl. And there was this beautiful geometry of the unfolded origami. And that to me was even more interesting than somebody else's pre-made pattern for, for a form, Uh just the, the folds in the paper that were ever present. Like you can't uncrease a piece of paper. And, and I put a cicada in it and that became, I titled it shelter. And that became like a revelation for me that maybe, maybe I could make a whole series incorporating paper and objects and paint and respond to that. So that's sort of how there were uh, several paintings in between there and this special snowflake, but that's kind of how the, the idea for paper snowflakes started. Got it. Yeah. And then, so now I, in my studio at home, I've got an installation of, gosh, I don't, I'm looking over, I'm trying to count really quickly, but uh, probably about 50, uh, I don't know, 50 or 75 paper snowflakes from all over the world that people have taken the time to cut. And I just love the image in my head is all these tiny little fragments of paper scattered around on everybody's floor. I just, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) And they're set up. And so if I'm not painting myself in this self portrait from a photo, I'm painting the snowflakes from, from life and just enjoying responding to that. Also with the paper came the idea of painting a lot of white on white. So in this painting, I'm wearing all white and really the only thing that is colorful, I mean, there's a lot of color in white, but that is really colorful is my palette that I'm holding. And then the little bits of my flesh that you can see through. So cool. I love it. (laughs) Hopefully I can paint it as well as I am describing it in my (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it's so funny. I I did something. Well, I did not do something similar, but it's just reminding me of the fact that like for, for our wedding, I got married in Argentina and there was a lot of people who could not come to the our wedding because it was so far away. So I asked everybody to mail in hearts. Oh, that's awesome. And so we had like our, our, the decorations are basically all these paper hearts that everybody mailed in hanging all over the place. And um, so like, I'm just getting that same vision with the snowflakes. And I know what you're like, I was imagining too, like all the different colors and people like their kids did it. And so like, you know, it's all sorts of perfectly cut hearts, misshapen hearts, and just like every personality showed through with that. And it was so cool. So I'm kind of imagining that snowflakes must have been similar with that regard. Yeah. And I can definitely tell like there, there are at least a few that are exactly alike. So these people were on Pinterest. <laughs> like to- <laughs> <laughs> paper snowflake, you know? And I think there's some hilariousness about that too. (laughs) That's really funny. (laughs) Oh, darn it. So we can't say that no two snowflakes are are alike anymore. They're pretty darn close. Yeah. And and I, I probably have omitted those, but they, my, my overall idea for this series is that I'll have these incredible paper objects that I've created or that other people have created and they'll become an installation in, let's say a museum. Let's put that out there. And then on the walls will be my paintings of these objects. And yeah, so people will get to walk through and experience and touch and maybe even destroy, which would, which is a pretty interesting idea, the, the paper because it is so temporal. It's so fragile and that's okay with me if they disintegrate. And be a part of that object's experience and then have the the paintings be present as well on the walls. Yeah. And even like, I also really like that, that destruction aspect of it because, you know, snow and snowflakes are so temporal, like they're, they're supposed to dissolve and become something else. Right. And I think, you know, these were made from trees and if a tree is going to have to be cut down to, to be made into a paper snowflake, it really should go back to the earth too. So. Mm-hmm. I like it. Very cool. I still have paper cut snowflakes in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something about it that reminds me a little bit of Christo with his, you know, when he would, he would wrap, you know, like objects in fabric. Yeah. There's some connection there. There's a tangent there. I'm not, I'm not totally grasping it yet, but I feel like it's there. Well, I want to do like a huge, I don't want to say this idea because then it will be out there, but a huge something or other. And it's so big that people could, could walk through it. But then as they, they walk through it, you know, it, it self destructs. Um, but yeah, yeah. Mm. The scale, like it definitely, it started off small with those hand size origami objects, but they're, they're getting bigger and bigger and more interactive with, with humans. Like, there's, there's one painting where there, there's a mask on one of my, it's a double figure, the same figure, but even I want the paper to become even more foreboding, more, more present than the figure. Is that, are you talking about the one that's your profile? What is it? Delude? Delude. Yeah. Delude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just putting all the accents on the wrong syllables, <laughs> English and Spanish. My husband loves it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that one is delude. And it, it's mostly about self-delusion and how we, we trick ourselves. I guess I trick myself a lot. And is that figure with the mask on, is she a nefarious character or is she a helpful character? And you don't, you can't quite tell. And that amb- ambiguity is beautiful to me that mm-hmm. I like to find those in-between moments with with figurative work where the viewer has to stop and look and think for a minute and whether they come up with the answer or not is awesome if they don't actually, because I don't often have the answers, but then, but I'm making them pause. That's, that's what those kind of mysterious moments can, can create. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think like what I remember feeling when I first saw that painting was at first the math, like masks can be kind of frightening, right? Yeah. Because they're somehow hiding that person. But then the body language felt more protective. So then I kind of was like thinking, there's that first like, huh? 
Right. And, and with any, any, and I guess that's how we see strangers or any new situation. There's that pause and is this person or is this situation dangerous or is it okay? And you have that quick assessment, whether you're aware of it or not. Right. And so then I kind of was feeling like, okay, it's okay. And then I started telling myself the story <laughs> of like, okay, well, she, she's feels like a wolf. And to me, wolves are very protective and, you know, like, or dogs, you know, are very protective. And the body language to me was more, more about protection in a way, I guess, than anything else. So that's really interesting that, the, you know, like how many different ways that we can interpret that and allow it to be ambiguous. And every single person is going to have their own story. And maybe at different moments have a different story too. I know there's times when I look at that and I'm like, gosh, she's such a bitch. Why is she doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Leave her alone. Let her go. She obviously wants to get up from the chair. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And it's a dog, so I can say that word. It's a female dog. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> so just to wrap it up, like I have not asked this question in a while. So I'm going to ask you, if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be or whose? Oh, God, that's so hard. I know. <laughs> I'm going to ask the other question. Like if you could talk to yourself. 10, 20 years ago. <laughs> Darn, I was okay, we'll start. That. We can start with that one. And then I will go because I am going to torture you now. And yeah, then I'm going to go back to that one. I'm not going to let you slide. But what advice would you give to yourself, the artist that you were 10 years ago? Not to run away from the business aspect of this career. You know, I think for as a young artist, even 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 now I fight it. But, you know, I thought you're not really an artist if you're thinking about money, if you're thinking about this as a business and you're not a real artist. And I it's been been tough to overcome that in my own in my own brain. Like, yeah, you need to keep painting. So you need to make money mm-hmm. and, and also to not be so. Well, again, I need to tell myself this daily, but not to be so hard on myself. Mm. There is no comparison game. Like this is my path and this is just honoring that path that I'm on that is uniquely my own and valid. That is a big, big lesson to to continually remind myself. Yeah, it's huge because I want like the crystal ball that tells me that I'm on the right path and that like, okay, if you continue, you are right. And if you continue doing what you're doing, you will have the outcome that you're hoping for. Or, you know, like things like that. Like you just kind of want to know that like, I I don't mind doing the work, but I want to know that I'm working on the right thing. I want that crystal ball, but it doesn't exist. And also without the mystery and the missteps and all of that, we wouldn't, we would miss so many opportunities, so many tangents, so many lessons. Beautiful tangents. Yeah. 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 Like I would never have come to the paper if I, if I had a plan. (laughs) Right. Oh. Right. I love it. And the business thing too, like that's another thing. Like I, I talked, <laughs> I don't know, like I feel there's, I have two things that I just want to comment on that. And number, the number one, and this is kind of like to most artists out there is what makes you think what you do is not worth anything, you know, because we always have this, like, there's a reluctance. It's not that I can't, the people simultaneously want to sell their art for significant amounts of money And they also don't want to sell their art and they want it to be quote unquote pure or whatever. But like, I think that behind that is sometimes a fear that it's not worth anything. And right. Validity of it. Yeah. 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 Beyond the money aspect. Is this going to mean anything after, well, while I'm here and after I'm gone, does it, does it matter? Right. It absolutely does. Like that's like, it matters that we create it and it matters to other people. It's like that person who walked into to women on women and was crying. It clearly like it matters so much. It's part of being human. It's part of sharing our stories. It's part of connecting on, on a different level than just than verbally. And those are all parts of our cultural language that you can't, not have it or we will be so deprived i think as human beings yeah and and it's already tending to be to be taken out you know taken out of curriculums and taken out of uh, out of our common everyday 
experience. So it yeah. is maybe now needed more than ever. Yeah, I think so. I think it I think it creates a dialogue, it gets people to ask questions, it brings in curiosity, it brings in beauty and my God, we need that so much. All of that. Do you happen to know the Winston Churchill quote? I'm not going to be able to pull it out of my head, but it's it's something like, you know, what is society worth if there aren't poets and artists? Something something like that. Mm. Like, what's the point? Yeah. Why have a civilization if there isn't somebody to recognize the beauty in it? Yeah, exactly. And I wish, like, I feel like, you know, like, especially with the show and talking to you, we're sort of preaching to the choir. I don't know how to, you know, like. How to get it out bro- more broadly. Yeah, how to communicate that on a broader scale, because there's so many people who just like, I remember, I I need to talk to him now, this would be really interesting. I remember talking to my friend's little brother, who was about 20, I think at the time, and he was studying, you know, like his study was more like business economics, and etc. So he, he kind of was going into this field where you need to measure everything. And I remember we were having, we were having a conversation and he probably had, you know, a little bit too much wine. And, and, you know, I was definitely the odd woman out as an artist that everybody else there were def- were in business oriented vocations or careers. And he just looked at some, we were talking about art and my art. And at some point he said something like, why would I even bother to buy original art? Why wouldn't I just get a poster for five bucks at where I, <laughs> world one or co- whatever it is and I was Turn like, that knife. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I will I will freely admit that I was furious when he said it <laughs> yeah. but then there's you know like there's I feel like there needs the answer to that is you know it's it's an original piece of art that speaks to you in a way that a poster can never never can it's a it's a moment in a conversation that you can, you know, continually find new pieces of it. I would guess that that person hadn't made something in a really long time, hadn't had mm. the, the joy of connecting with something through your hands, feeling it in your hands. And yeah. maybe if he had that experience more recently, he would see the, the value of it, that it's not it's not only about communication. Like there is a a satisfaction to holding something tangible, beautiful that some other human vibrated against, you know, there's this, this connection. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Huh. I'm going to have to think about that more. Like, and and actually like, we're like, he's 30 something. Like, I'm not sure. I think he's in his, well, he's definitely in his thirties now, but, and he's had more life experience. So I'm going to like, give him a hard time and ask him again, like, do you remember saying that? And what do you think now? <laughs> I'll be curious to see if he's had any experience that's changed him. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause at that point it was literally just a dollar, you know, like I can get five, I can, to him, he didn't see any difference. I can spend $5 or I can spend 500. Of course I'm going to spend $5, you know, or whatever the, whatever that is. Yeah. Hopefully let's, let's hope that your conversation turned, turned something for him. Right. Or I'm just going to smack him upside the head. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Back to that question. Uh, well, I am staring at a brochure from the Freeland Museum of Art from a show that's, that's at the University of Virginia. It was a show that I saw last fall on my way up to Pennsylvania, and it was a very small room filled with Ann Gale paintings. And if I could go home with all of them, <laughs> I would. <laughs> they were talk about vibrating. Oh my God. Those paintings were so amazing to me. I just, oh uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I would be happy for long, long, long forever. If I could own an Ann Gale work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Right. When you said that I had this visceral, like, little flutter of oh my god yes because you know like so I'm listening to you and I kind of close my eyes a little bit when I'm listening so I don't get distracted so immediately the image of some of her work that I got to see at a show she did in San Francisco came into mind and I was like had the same yeah even just imagining seeing it and standing in front of it had a very similar response and so yeah yeah this they painted the walls really almost black but dark dark gray and it was a room smaller than my studio, you know, probably even smaller than my daughter's bedroom. And 
nobody was there and I had the <gasps> whole room to myself and oh my gosh. And I was there by myself, you know, a rare moment when I didn't have little hands tugging me along through the museum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was awesome. I, uh, that, it's a, it's a indelibly placed itself in my brain. Alia, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I have very much enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate you spending the time. Oh, I am. Uh, it was all my pleasure. Thank you so much, Entries. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast with Alia El Bermani. Go to SavvyPainter.com for the show notes on this episode. You can see Alia's paintings, including Special Snowflake. Connect with her on Instagram and, of course, see links to other artists mentioned in this show. One more thing I want to let you know. This year, you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop, so you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.